The Taoists would say that nothing that goes against nature's ordinances can last forever. Mm. It is only a momentary blip. Yeah. Um, all evil, should it even exist, and they did believe it existed, is merely carries within it the seed of its own destruction. Mm. Yeah. Things rise and they fall. So just give evil a lot of space. Let it do its little thing, but never have any concern at all that it's going to stop the water flowing on the waterfall, the light from shining on the lake, uh, you know, from the breath and the and the ether being there. You see, they're not in, they're not interested in that. And the and the reason why they're not interested in it is because the Taoist has no time for anything that men generate as a collective. They also have nothing to do with man, with anything that is created by the thoughts of men. I know this sounds really weird until you realize what the philosophical premises are underneath all of these theories. Anything that is generated by the mind of man is of secondary or, or, or almost no interest to a Taoist because they're only interested in his existence. Mm. They're not interested in their people's image of themselves or what they have then subsequently created in the world based on those images. And they're certainly not interested in anything that civilization or mass movements create because the Taoist sees those as purely momentary aberrations in the in the flow of, 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 of reality, you see. It, what a quirk in a way very strange in that sense and what about if we uh, you know uh, at the end of this first hour here Michael begin to round things up on the note of, of basically the reality of existence to go over a few more points on that basically what what role the mind plays in the creation of the world you mentioned computer program before uh, either if you want to talk more about that or specifically basically about what the the power of our own imagination you know the, the fact that we seem to create all of this as well and you, you alluded to Solaris before as an example of this Yes, this is the power of the unconscious. The unconscious comes in very strongly because, <clears throat> as we said, not only does the instinct of true rebellion and true individualism reside within the unconscious of everyone, the Jungian and Freudian definitions of the unconscious, in my opinion, are somewhat flawed. They're, they're, they're largely correct, but there's one thing that they both somewhat lack or didn't emphasize. For Freud and Jung, the unconscious contains repressions, right? The content that you repress. Yeah. The only difference between them was that Freud just believed you did it in this life, and Jung said, no, there's a collective one where all mankind has been doing it. However, they didn't emphasize uh, enough something much more interesting, and that is that at the deepest um, hemispheres of the unconscious is where actually the self exists, the, the true self, the whole self, not the ego. And it, it is that self that was once upon a time at the font of all knowledge, like the ancestors were, were commenting. That self is the self that is nature, is the self, okay? Mm. Like the lemnascate, you know? Mm. The figure eight on its side. That self is very deeply in, in, the, in what we call the unconscious. And as we said before on other shows, it's only called unconscious because your ego is, is the light keeper and just simply won't turn the light on so that you can see the whole of, of your consciousness, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, imagine it like a landscape, almost like a Tolkien-like landscape where you've got a tower on one end of the horizon and another tower on the other horizon, but there's a darkness in between, you know, and you can't see them both. Mm. So there's a tower of the self and the tower of the ego, and they're just rivaling the hell out of each other, you know? <laughs> but deep in the unconscious is this um, is the self, and that's why psychologists in general try to work with you to bring forth the self. Now, say you were to take a virtual tour of the unconscious. Say I could wave a magic wand and everyone could immediately take in just half an hour a virtual tour of everything that exists within the collective unconscious and, and take it like a um, magical uh, ride, you know, all the way from where you are now, all the way through the darkest re reservoirs of the underworld, right through the unconscious, right down to its ancestral memories, all the uh, impressions and uh, um, archetypes and all the ideas, everything that makes up the unconscious, just like going to the moon, you know, like in Solaris, just like going to the planet. Or Dune is another movie that also talks about this in a way, the, the ocean planet, mm, yeah. representing the unconscious and the free men being archetypes with the lustrous eyes and all of these kinds of things, you see. Yeah. And this endless emphasis on water, which is a Taoist principle, by the way. So um, imagine that you can take this virtual tour and then you come back. You, you get off the couch and you say, I've been all the way through the unconscious, right to the very first thought that ever was thought by the first man in the world. If Jung is right that the unconscious is, is made up of every thought of every man, every experience of motherhood, every experience of fire, every experience of fear, every experience of, uh, of, of a mystery, which then later on became the God idea to account for that mystery, every experience of the hunt, 
every experience of animal, every experience of cold. You see, imagine you had the chance, like in that movie, um, also it's called um, what is it? It's the Ken uh, Ken Russell movie. Uh, which, I'm thinking of which uh, one is this? Here. The early one where they go into the big thing. They go into this suspended animation tank. And one of the guys regresses and becomes like an ape. Oh yeah, yeah. That's called uh, altered states. Altered states, right. This is, again, what I'm talking about, that this guy actually started to regress through the limbic areas of his brain and so on, forth and so on. Well, imagine you could do that in just two minutes. According to the Jungian theory, you'd actually step out in the now, Henrik. Mm. The deeper you get into the unconscious, the more you return to the present moment. And it's fascinating how that works. If we have a few minutes, I'd like to explain it. Yeah, go ahead. Jung said... Um, See, a lot of people thought that Freud and Jung were different because Jung was mystical and Freud was, was atheistic or practical. This is not true. Jung and Freud were on the same page. Freud said that all human experience is gained in this life. Your mind is blank and everything that a child knows is learned in this life from experience. A lot of people who haven't read Jung very deeply think he didn't agree with that. Yes, he did. Even though he has his unconscious memory bank, which is the unconscious, the collective unconscious, is bigger than Freud's idea of the unconscious. The very first man who had the very first experience on Earth in order to create any idea at all still learnt it from experience. Mm -hmm. So Freud, Jung's idea of experience is just backdated. That's all the difference is. So in other words, if you took this virtual tour of the unconscious to get back to being the first atom, the first man, whatever way you want to look at it, who had the first scent of a rose, who had the first feeling of water in a river running over his hand, you see? who looked up to the magnitude of the sky, who felt the heat of the sun on his face, who experienced the first color, green or blue or whatever it might have been, you see, who experienced the exhilaration of his legs running. All of these original uh, concepts, which is the content of the unconscious, was learned from experience. So if you were to go right back to, to thought one, you'd step out of a door back into the world, back into the arms of Mother Nature, which was the first teacher, the first guide. In other words, it's like the, it's like the beautiful poem of T.S. Eliot. In the end, right, in our endings is our beginnings, and when we arrive at the end, we return to the place of the beginning and know that place for the first time. Mm. Mm. This incredible, you know, the four quartets that he wrote. It's that kind of idea. So then knowing this, you discover that why then have an unconscious at all if even in the Freudian and the Jungian model, and in the Kantian model, because Immanuel Kant, the philosopher, is saying nothing more than Jung said, just in, in different terminology, then... Why do you even need the, the collective unconscious at all or the unconscious at all if it is itself predicated upon direct living experience or existence in the now? Mm, yeah, press that shield or a sheet between yourself and the experience that you're having in a way. Right, because remember, as we said, the re society is the one that decides what the ego will repress. Mm. In other words, it decides what the content of the collective unconscious will be. Not all of it, of course. But the world that you live in and the people that you know, the mothers and fathers, priests and politicians and everything else, is largely responsible for making you repress aspects of your own selfhood into what is known as the unconscious and dumping it there. That content then acts on the world secretly behind your back and then you, you interface with the world again. Okay. But because that unconscious content is influencing the world, you are not then seeing the world as Heidegger is asking you to see it and as the Taoists are asking you to see it, which is directly. You're not able to do that because, as you just said, you're projecting the sheet, you're projecting this imago, a very thick one, a very deep, con uh, conditioned imago of, of the way the world should be, the way other people should be. Then we become our own policemen. Hey, I want you to be like I want you to be. Yeah. You can't be yourself. And that person screaming at, at me, Tweedledum and Tweedledee, you know. You should be this way and you should be this way. No, you should be this way. It's called projection. Yeah. And we're also demanding that the world conform in this way. We ask civilizations to conform to this way. So we then, in the Heideggerian terms, have a distorted or broken mirror. Or our projector is broken the program, the distorted program of the Mysterium is still running and we can never see the world as it really is. And therefore, anything we build out of that distortion is going to be yet further flawed. It will just rise as a Tower of Babel only to crash to the ground again. And it's never been more prominent if we consider what's going on in the world today as well with all these, again, unification, the homogenous uh, approach to what reality is. Uh, never mind if the data, even in the scientific model, is skewed or not. Every, this is the reality now and everyone should abide to it, you know, whatever it, it is concerned about. Even if it's concerned about everyone should get the vaccine or everyone now should uh, 
uh, stop breathing pretty much because of all the carbon that you you know you put out there. You know, it's 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 just incredible. It's uh, it's almost like it feels a bit just what you said there, Michael. It's like uh, the tower the Tower of Babel is it's it's it comes the highest just before it kind of falls and crashes down in a way. You know, because it's so high and it's built on a on a on a on a sta unstable foundation, if you know what I mean. Which it goes back to your original point about uh, the Taos not interfering. They go, we'll see you again. You want to head down there? Okay, we'll wait. You'll be back. Hmm. But anyway, this thing that you're talking about, about it's no more uh, it's no more applicable than today. Maybe in the next section I can address that specifically, though, because there's certain key parts. That, how much time do we have left in this one? Uh, well, we have a couple of minutes here, uh, Michael. We should begin to round things up. But is there something you want to leave us with here in the first hour? Yeah, let's introduce this then. What I'd like to say is that... Um, when we know that the Mysterium is operating and we don't see the world or other people or even ourselves, and people can pick, pick which of those three is the worst, right? Yeah. It's up to them. But when you know that we're not seeing the world, other people or ourselves as we really, really are, because it's distorted by this Mysterium that arose at the time of the uh, falling off and the time of the, the birth of the ego, then we, under, we can then account for, we've accounted for the God idea, why man throws up the God. The God is his pseudo-self. It's his pseudo collective self sh shared by every single person. But the, the thing that really leads us into the next half is this. And this accounts for the modern rise of technology and science. And I wouldn't even say science because I'm not bashing tech technicalness or science. I'm bashing what's known as scientism. Specifically, scientism is the philosophy that scientists have that only science can understand the meaning of life. Hmm. Heidegger was against it. The existentialists are against it. I'm against it. Scientism is what we're really critiquing here. But. There's one fundamental thing that people need to always remember when it comes to these philosophical questions. And that is, the first tutorial of the Mysterium is this. The, tutor the Mysterium has convinced man that he, sub remember it's subconscious, he is the creator of nature and of his own mind. You have to understand that the mind operates for all intents and purposes as if it is the creator of what it sees of nature and even of thinking. But of course, a little common sense tells you that that is absolutely the opposite. Nature is the creator of not only man himself, but of the mind. Inwardly, in, this, in, the, in, the, in the depths of the ego, the mind understands this. And this is the reason for what is known as the universal antipathy towards nature. Nature is ontologically and metaphysically superior to mind, and mind doesn't like that. Yeah. And so mind has sought to, in a sort of strange Lovian and Frankensteinian way, Dr. Frankensteinian way, to set about to try and humble and subjugate nature, and also to try and find the socket of energy into which nature is plugged, so that it can either unplug nature or at least share in its power. And of course, that, it's not visible. Nature is what's called negentropic. It's self-preserving uh, and self-creating, self-preserving and self-monitoring. Man wants to know the secret of that power and his technology and his science is in fact orchestrated to try and do that, to rival nature. You can't understand what's happening in the world today or even the rise of philosophy or any of these other materialistic models until this is understood. And again, it's psychologically based.